Where we are heading today is a very small archaeological site, but what we're going to see and learn about this site will once again connect us directly with the Bible. Stay tuned. So I'm going to date myself in telling you that I remember the old song that I learned in Sunday school class that went something like, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling. You got it. Down. Well, I'm not going to sing the whole song for you, but that's where we're heading today. In fact, it's... I think, one of the most important archaeological sites in Israel, and certainly not the largest. In fact, it's very small, relatively speaking. And it's located here on the sort of the northwest side of the Dead Sea. You can see where I'm pointing to, just at the very southern end of the Jordan Valley as it extends from the north, from the Sea of Galilee. But that's where we're heading today. Uh, There's an Old Testament site, and know that there's also a New Testament site just a little south of the Old Testament archaeological site. But our focus will be, of course, on this guy named Joshua and what he saw, uh, stone revetment walls, and uh, a few other things of interest. So, again, thanks for joining our teaching today. Uh, Please subscribe and hit the bell. If you're interested in following and tracking our next uh, teaching sessions as well, we do our best to teach the Bible in the context of the land of Israel. So let's head to Jericho. Jericho is a modern city, a Palestinian city, and right in the middle of this modern city is Tel Es Sultan, or Jericho. This is an archaeological site that's been excavated since the early 1900s by a German team, later on by two British teams in the 30s and 50s. Our focus at the end of our visit here will be those walls that you see here in the southern end. So let's walk up this small tell. It's only about 10 acres or so in size, a relatively small Canaanite city. And according to Joshua 6, it was the first city taken by Joshua. Looking eastward, we can look across the Jordan Valley. And underneath this large green tree was the spring of the city, later on purified by the prophet Elisha. Looking westward, we can see the edge of the Judean desert. In fact, that flatter portion of the cliff on top. In fact, we see it here. It's the traditional location for the temptation of Jesus. But our intent is to look at the site and primarily a couple archaeological structures, one of which is a a tower. Actually, there is no consensus on what this structure was. Most call it a tower. However, as we walk down this trench to this structure itself, we'll notice that besides being older than Abraham, It also had an opening on the top. This is over 20 feet high. So because of the opening, some 
would suggest that it may have been a tomb. So here is the opening as we look down into this structure. Some suggest that it was perhaps a fortification tower. However, there doesn't seem to be any walls on either side attached to it. So perhaps we'll have to be content with not really knowing what it was. So as we walk back out of this trench, it was a method of archaeology introduced in the 50s primarily because when you make a trench like this you can see exposed the different layers on both sides of this trench and just around the bend we can still see remnants of a burn level. This corresponds of course to this Joshua 6 story that we'll talk about and how the city was not only captured but burned. You can still see remnants of charcoal. And then also some remnants of some mud brick. Mud bricks were placed on top of the stone wall that we'll see in a short moment as we circle to the southern end of the site. The use of mud bricks was common in the days of the Bronze Age. But our main interest is to see the walls at the southern end and here are the retaining walls, the stone retaining walls that Joshua would have seen. Now there's a debate whether these walls should be dated to the time prior to Joshua in what we call the Middle Bronze period or whether they correspond to the conquest of the, of the nation in the 15th century or in the beginning of the Late Bronze period. It was a double wall. You can see one on the outside and one further on the inside. And yet we see the top of this retaining wall now and know that according to the story, the walls came tumbling down. The question is, what wall was it? It was most likely the mud brick wall that once stood on top of this stone retaining wall. We'll see a good example of a mud brick wall that predates this stone wall, at least according to a few archaeologists. And uh, here it is right in view. Take this mud brick wall that dates to the Middle Bronze period and place that type of wall on top of the stone wall. So take this wall and try to imagine that type of wall being on top of the stone wall, making the entire height of the wall in the days of Joshua at least 25 feet high. And yet on the seventh day, the Israelites circled the city and it was the mud brick wall placed on top of the stone wall that came tumbling down. The city was conquered and destroyed and burned. In fact, archaeologists have discovered many evidences of the burn level and the complete destruction of the city. So I also need to just say this because in scholarship there are many archaeologists and biblical scholars, and I'll maybe use that term a little uh, loosely because of what I want to share with you. Because after the Germans excavated here in, in the early 1900s, and then a guy named John Garstang in the 1930s, followed by Catherine Kenyon, it was really Kenyon's uh, perspective and interpretation of what she found that really changed uh, the view within scholarship 
of the relationship between archaeology and the Bible. And let me just simplify the whole discussion uh, to these uh, observations. Uh, number one, uh, Kenyon was one who dated the walls that we saw at the southern end to a time period called the Middle Bronze. She dated them to about a, about 150 years prior to the time uh, using an early date for the conquest of, of the land of Canaan uh, in about 1410 B.C. Kenyon dated those walls to about 1550 B.C., about 150 years prior. So what she concluded then is certainly the city was destroyed. In fact, she found uh, destruction levels that were about a meter thick, burn levels, if you will. Garstang and Kenyon both found uh, storage jars filled with grain that was burned. Incidentally, matching the, the description of the destruction of the city precisely according to Joshua chapter 6. But she concluded that while the city was destroyed, it was certainly destroyed prior to when the Bible says that Joshua was supposed to be here. Therefore, she concluded that when Joshua did arrive here uh, on uh, this western side of the Jordan River, uh, there was no city for him to conquer. And therefore, just perhaps she put into doubt that the Bible can't be trusted historically. Maybe the story didn't happen at all. And you can see the repercussions in scholarship when you conclude this based on the archaeology of the site. Now, I still honor those who believe in a, a later conquest date, that would be the 13th century, because there's also a way of looking at these walls uh, as being still being used by the city, even by Joshua, who came perhaps 200 years later. But I personally take an early conquest date of about 1410 B.C., and certainly I think, according to uh, some uh, evidence that has been uh, shared by guys like Dr. Bryant Wood and Associates for Biblical Research, that those walls actually date to precisely the time when the Bible says that Joshua is supposed to be here, at the early part of what we call the Late Bronze Period, in about 1410 B.C. So if that's the case, the stone walls that we saw together were actually the same walls that Joshua saw himself. And of course, it was, as I described, the mud brick wall that was placed on top of that stone revetment wall that came tumbling down. In fact, it fell, it fell outward, as the archaeologists have discovered, perhaps even making a natural ramp, if you will, for Joshua and his in his troops to conquer the city. And then last but not least, we also need to talk about Rahab. Because, of course, Rahab was uh, the Canaanite woman who ends up within the genealogy of Jesus. So God's redemptive plan even included the rescuing of Rahab and her family. And, uh, of course, as we read in the New Testament, Rahab as I just mentioned, makes the genealogy list leading to the birth of Jesus. So, I think is a perfect blend here between archaeology and the Bible, and what we saw there together uh, matches perfectly with, again, the biblical text. The biblical text, the Bible, is trustworthy in every detail. So don't miss that aspect of this teaching. The archaeology simply reveals and confirms the historicity of the Bible. So thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our visit together to the Old Testament site of Jericho. Until next time, shalom and thanks.